Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to Prophecy Encounter, coming to you live from Sanford, Florida. Very warm welcome to those joining across the country and around the world, part of our extended Bible study group today. And also, I'd like to welcome those of you here in Sanford, Florida. Thank you for braving the rain to come out and join us. Very important subject this evening. We're going to be talking about the 144,000 and the seal of God. Very important theme that we find in the book of Revelation. Now, we do have some additional resources that's available, especially to those who are viewing at the Prophecy Encounter website, just prophecyencounter.com. There is a set of lessons that kind of go along with the different themes that are being presented throughout this series. A big part of what we are talking about deals with the second coming of Jesus. That is the great hope of the Christian, the coming of Christ. And we have a theme song that we like to sing that talks about the second coming of Jesus. It's called Lift Up the Trumpet. Jesus is coming again. And Pablo and Kelly will lead us as we sing together. Let's stand as we sing our theme song. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up your children. Be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. remain standing for opening prayer by our senior pastor, Pastor Orlando Lopez. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us here this evening to hear about the love of Jesus. We thank you because that love gives us the hope that he will come again and take us home. We ask that this evening you speak in a powerful way as you have before through your son, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Be with us tonight and send your Holy Spirit to be in this place in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We've been receiving emails from oh, all over the place, even in different countries around the world, commenting on this series that we're doing, dealing with Bible prophecy. And a number of the comments that come in is people expressing their appreciation for the question and answer time that we put in the program. Folks say, boy, you're answering questions that, that I have, or... Now I understand this Bible verse a little bit clearer. So we're just delighted that Pastor Doug and Karen Batchelor are here to lead us in another segment of Bible Questions. Thank you, Pastor Ross. Evening, everybody. Glad to see each of you here. Again, I want to welcome those who are watching the Prophecy Encounter meetings uh, via television or on the Internet. And, of course, we're very thankful for those who are coming and being part of our live study group here in uh, Sanford, Florida. Amen. And so we have some questions. Hello, how are we you We do. Here? I'm well, thank you for asking. Okay. <laughs> well, you never know, yes. so. All right, our first question tonight. Can you please explain Matthew 16, verse 18, where Jesus says to Peter that upon this rock, I will build my church. Okay, I saw this question coming in actually just before the program, so I marked it here in my Bible. If you look in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, uh, Jesus is at, you have to go back a few verses. Jesus is asking a question, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, some others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said, who do you say I am? Peter spoke up and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now this has often been quoted to suggest that Peter was in effect the first pope. And that Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to that apostle. Uh, and that Peter is the rock upon which the church is built. But a little closer study, and especially if you look at it in the original language, it doesn't really say that at all. Jesus says in uh, verse 18, I say to you that you are Peter. That's a word that means uh, petros. It's a, a stone, something you might find tumbling around in a creek. He said, but on this petra, on this rock, petra, this is a rock like Yosemite, a rock of immense proportion. I will build my church. What is the petra? Is it Peter, the apostle? Or is it the statement that Jesus was the Christ? Upon that I will build my church. Did he give the keys of the kingdom just to Peter? Later in the Gospel of John, it basically says, I'm giving to all of the believers the keys to be able to share the good news. The key is in the knowledge, the truth about Jesus that sets people free. And if you have any, uh, any concerns about whether or not Peter was the first pope, just keep reading in that same chapter. Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'll die, I'll rise the third day. Peter took them aside and began to rebuke him and said, far be it from you, Lord, this is not going to happen to you. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Hmm. So one place they're saying that he's the first pope, the next same chapter, a few verses later, he says, get behind me, Satan. Let's hope he's not the leader of the church that everything is built on. Because Peter kind of vacillated back and forth a little bit. A little later, he denies Christ. The statement of Peter, that courageous, faithful statement, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, you're a rolling stone, you're Peter, but on this rock that I am the Christ, I will build my church. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, thank you. What prophecies have yet to be fulfilled before Jesus can return? Well, you know, as we're going through our study in Revelation and Daniel, there's a lot of things that still remain to happen. Of course, uh, gospel needs to go into all the world. Uh, the seven plagues have not happened yet. The uh, institution of the law of the beast that says you cannot buy or sell unless you receive the mark of the beast. These things are still future. But don't ask that question thinking, I can relax until these things happen. Then I'll get serious. How many of you wait until uh, a day or two before your taxes are due before you file. <laughs> Come on, I know there's more of you out there. We Some don't, you, we pay us before. Then. She's good, yeah, we do like three or, <laughs> three or four days before. It, but yeah, uh, April human nature, day. typically people wait until the last minute, right? So don't be saying, how much still has to happen before Jesus comes thinking he could come for you today? Mm -hmm. you're, if, you know, if your heart stops and you die, your next conscious thought is a resurrection, first or second resurrection, and the, the judgment, and so we don't want to tamper with eternity. No, we want to be ready every day, don't we? Be ready always, All the right. Bible says. This next question. I know Satan can tempt us, but can he read our minds? Well, the devil is pretty good at making an educated guess of what you're thinking. And when we say the devil, Satan is probably not personally acquainted with everybody in the world because he is not all-knowing like God is. Satan has angels, fallen angels, and he's probably divided up his work among them. And, uh, but they study our weaknesses and they plant temptations and they can look at our body language and expressions. And I can sometimes tell what she's thinking because we've been married so long, I sort of know her. So, and she's but, right now thinking about what am I thinking? No, to I'm see thinking, if I can guess what she's thinking? I'm thinking, but sometimes you can't and you're really, really wrong. I know. Well, that's because <laughs> I'm not God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the Bible because, says... It's because my face does things that my mind doesn't want it to do, and he reads my face, but it, I'm really not thinking that, but I look like I'm thinking that. <laughs> I said sometimes. Didn't I say sometimes? <laughs> okay. Matter of fact, rarely, actually, now that I think about it. <laughs> anyway, back to the devil. I'm sorry. He can't read our minds. The Bible says in, I think it's uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 in the dedication prayer of Solomon... Solomon says, for Lord, thou and thou only know the thoughts of the sons of men. The mm -hmm. Bible says Jesus knew what was in their hearts. Uh, it tells us that Christ knew what was in man. So God knows what we think. Uh, the devil, he can't read your mind. Only God can do that. And so some people think, well, if the devil can't read my mind, then I'll just pray quietly. 
and he won't know what I'm praying. No, don't, I've heard people say that. Don't do that. Jesus prayed out loud. It scares the devil when you pray. Don't be afraid to pray out loud. But he can't read your mind. Why do we pray, thy will be done on earth? Does this mean his will is not done on earth? So how can God be omnipotent? If God's all-powerful, then wouldn't that mean his will is all, always done on earth? Well, God is all-powerful, but he doesn't use that power to force his will on his creatures that have a free will. We would not be praying, thy will be done, if his will was always done. Does that make sense? And the Bible tells us, 2 Peter chapter 3, God is not willing that any should perish. But will some perish? Mm -hmm. Jesus had brought us a way that leads to destruction. It breaks his heart. He doesn't want it to happen. And so, no, not everything that happens in, in uh, the world is God's will. All the sin and suffering in, in this world, that's not his will. If you want to know what God's will was, you look in the Garden of Eden, and when he made the world, it says it was good, good, very good. Amen? Amen. That's God's will, and that's the purpose of plan of salvation, is to restore the will of God in this world. So yes, why he is all-powerful, God does not... Some are thinking, well, when the devil rebelled, why didn't God just zap him with some magnificent bolt of lightning and just vaporize him? He's all-powerful. Why does he let the devil go on? If God destroyed the devil too soon, some of the other creatures and other angels would think, well, maybe Lucifer's accusations were right. Uh, do you want to obey God? Because if you don't, he's going to hit you with lightning every time? Mm -mm. Do you want your children to obey you only because you walk around with a belt in your hand? No. no, you want them to obey you because what you're asking is reasonable, because they trust you, because they love you, right? You want to have a loving relationship. God doesn't use that kind of force. All right, thank you. Why do some numbers seem to appear more frequently in the Bible? Is there a reason for this? Yeah, good question. You'll notice that statistically there are some numbers that appear way more than you would think as an average in the Bible. Like the number seven. You know how many sevens there are in Revelation? Seven eyes, seven horns, seven trumpets, seven voices, seven churches, seven plagues, seven thunders, seven, seven seals, seven spirits, seven candlesticks. Seven candlesticks, that's just, that's, that's what we're doing off the top of our head. A lot, do your concordance or look in your computer for a lot of sevens just in Revelation. Seven in the Bible is a number that represents completion, a complete cycle or perfection. Uh, of course, the antithesis of that would be three and a half. Two, it's a, a complete interruption of seven. You notice how long we discovered the beast power would reign? 1,260 years or three and a half, uh, 1,260 days, a days a year. Three and a half, it's an interruption of seven. And you'll find that number appears a lot in the Bible. Jesus taught three and a half years, three and a half years from the cross to the stoning of Stephen, three and a half years of famine in the days of Elijah when the prophets were persecuted. Three and a half is usually not good. Forty is a generation, another number you see a lot. A lot of forties in the Bible. Uh, Twelve, symbol for the church. We'll study tomorrow. There's this woman with 12 stars above her head. 12 patriarchs in the Old Testament, 12 judges, 12 apostles, 12 is the symbol for the church and its leadership. 144,000, 12 times 12,000, our study tonight, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. 40, 10, 7, uh, there's a number of numbers that appear and they all kind of have symbolic meaning. Okay, for our last question, what does the term close of probation mean? Yeah, I think I may have referenced it, or you've heard it before. The close of probation. You all know what probation is. It means a trial period. Our lives right now, we have a trial period to decide how we're going to spend eternity. If it's going to be with Christ, or if we're going to live or perish. We get those two choices. But there'll be a period of time when probation closes in the world, yet life goes on. In the story of Noah, if you know the story of Noah... Noah built the ark, and finally when he completed the ark, all the animals got on board. Noah and his family got on board. God shut the door, and did the rain start immediately? Or were there seven days where Noah was sealed inside and the lost were sealed outside, but life went on? Um, their probation was closed. 
If a person commits the unpardonable sin, they cannot be forgiven, they may still be alive. Judas was for a little while, Balaam, King Saul, they grieved away the spirit, but their probation was closed. Revelation chapter 22 verse 11, there's a time when Christ declares, he that is just, let him be just still, he that, the last chapter of the Bible, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. And that means still means no more changing teams. Right now, by the grace of God, a sinner can come to Jesus, repent, and he can change. Mm -hmm. And even a righteous person can turn away. You hope that doesn't happen. But right now, people still have free choice. The time is going to come when the righteous are sealed, the wicked are lost, and probation closes. No changing teams. We don't want to wait until that happens. Someone asked a rabbi, what's the best day of your life to repent? And the rabbi said, the last day of your life. And they said, but what if you don't know what the last day is? He said, exactly. So Now is the best time. <laughs> Today, if you hear his voice. So after the close of probation, does that mean that um, we'll be living without a mediator? Well, when we are sealed, uh, when you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and you're, not, uh, you're filled with God's Spirit, there's nothing to mediate. At that point, then Christ is preparing to come, the saved to save, the lost to lost. And is that so, when the seven last plagues occur? You're getting ahead of me now. Sorry. Keep coming. <laughs> They're not on my list. I'm just asking. Trying to throw me. Are we out of time? Or you got We're more questions? We're out of time. We're out of time. <laughs> so for those of you who might like to ask a Bible question, we ask you to go to the Prophecy Encounter website and put your question there, and we look forward to being able to answer it. And if you would like to text a question, you can text it to 760 523 Two two eight seven. That phone number is seven six zero five two three two two eight seven. And we're very thankful tonight to have Robin Bear do our special music, and she will be accompanied by Kelly Mauer. And we're so thankful that Kelly's been able to join us on this this um, time. And Robin will be singing "Wonderful Peace." Oh. 
Thank you, Robin. Beautiful. Thank you, Kelly. Well, this evening, our sermon title is The 144,000 and the Seal of God. Now, one of the questions that was asked during our Q&A time this evening is, is there any significance to numbers in the book of Revelation? And the answer is yes. But one number in particular that's very significant is the 144,000. So a lot of questions out there about what exactly is the 144,000 and what is the seal of God. Pastor Doug is going to delve into that this evening. So once again, join me as we welcome the President Speaker of Amazing Facts, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Thank you very much, Pastor Ross. And thank you, friends, again for coming. I want to welcome you to our Prophecy Encounter meetings, and also want to welcome our friends that are watching on television or online somewhere around the world and one of the uh, many different um, outlets. I thank our friends who are broadcasting this on 3ABN. We've worked with them many times before in doing these programs and getting Prophecy Truth out there. Tonight our presentation is going to be dealing with the subject of the 144,000, which you find in chapter 7 and 14 of Revelation and the seal of God. And uh, it pictures a time when angels are holding back winds of strife. And I remember hearing a story about, I think it was in 2012 in March, Paul Walden had his wife and daughter call. They were at work and they said, have you seen the news? There's a terrible uh, stream of tornadoes that are coming through. And he never paid much attention to storm warnings. But he thought he ought to step outside and look at the sky. And right when he went outside to look up at the sky, he saw this great big gray wall that was moving towards him that was churning up his neighbor's house. And he thought, oh, this is the real thing. He ran inside, he grabbed a couple of dogs, and he jumped in the closet right by their staircase. And then it hit. You've heard the expression, it sounds like a freight train is going by when you have a tornado go by. And the whole house began to shake, and he had both hands on the door. With all of his strength, he was hanging on and trying to keep the door shut as the suction of the storm was trying to pull the door open and suck out him and his dogs. And it wasn't very long before it stopped, the noise settled, it moved down, it passed away, and he finally got the courage to open the door. And this is a picture of what he saw when he stepped outside. The house was gone, he walked out of the closet, and he saw a blue sky, Everything was gone, except the closet and some of the stairs. And he said it wasn't long after he walked outside and the closet fell over. And then the hail began to fall and he felt like he was getting beaten up by a baseball bat. And he found a container that held vacuum cleaning supplies. He put it on his head. He said he would have died from the hail. And his wife always teases him about walking around with a, a vacuum cleaner accessory box on his head to save his life. But he was trying to hold back the storm. Well, humans aren't very good at that. Angels do a good job. Revelation pictures this happening. Let's start with 144,000 in chapter 7 of Revelation. And you can begin with verse 1, chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Now, what do the four angels represent? the divisions of the compass. It's talking about simply north, south, east, and west. It's a universal problem. It's a universal uh, ceiling that's going to take place. Holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea or any tree. That's talking about everything on the planet. The earth, the sea, the trees. Until something happens. It's going to blow eventually. Those winds of strife are really, they're kind of summarized in the seven last plagues. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm the earth, or the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. And it goes on to say, I heard the number of those that were sealed, and it was 144,000. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's an interesting list that is given. Then you'll also read in chapter 14, as a matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, I won't have it on the screen, so I'm just going to read it to you here from the Bible. You go to chapter 14 of Revelation, you find the second reference to the 144,000, and it gives us a little more information about them. I looked, and behold, 
a lamb, this is verse 1 of chapter 14, Revelation, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their forehead. Well, 7 said it was the seal of God. Here it says his father's name. That must be similar. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like a voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harps and harpists playing their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and before the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women for they're virgins. What does that mean? These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And then it goes on to another passage that is related, but we'll pause right there. So you've got the 144,000 are obviously a very important group. You've got you know, chapter 7 addresses them. Chapter 14 addresses them. They're very close to the Lord. They receive a special seal. Now typically, if you talk to somebody about revelation and something in the forehead, what do you think about? Everybody automatically thinks about, oh, you don't want anything in your forehead in the last days. Someone tries to put anything in your forehead. Run the other way. But if you study the Bible, you'll find out in Revelation, everybody's got something in their forehead in the last days. You've either got the mark of the beast or you have the seal of God. You just want to make sure you've got the right mark. And sort of with that as an introduction, let's go through some of our questions now that talk about the 144,000 and the seal of God. First question, what clues does Revelation provide to help us identify who are the 144,000? Well, there's several things. First of all, it says there's 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the list of tribes that are given in Revelation is different from any other list in the Bible. The 12 tribes are listed many times in the Bible. They usually start with the firstborn who is Judah. I'm sorry, Reuben. But in Revelation, it starts with Judah. It's different. It's a different list. You'll find that it talks about um, uh, Joseph, but uh, Ephraim is left out. And so it's a unique list, and you, you need to... Uh, just say, what's going on here? Are these real, literal Jews it's talking about? In the last days, he's going to get 12,000 from each of the tribes. If you know your Jewish history, you'll know that some of the tribes had very few people. And Judah had lots of people, you know, hundreds of thousands. And so the idea of getting an even number from each of the tribes, that would be interesting. But I believe they're actually talking about spiritual Jews. That means it could include literal Jews and it can include people who have been adopted into the seed of Abraham by accepting Christ. Let me tell you why. You read in the Bible in the Old Testament, for instance, go to 2 Kings 17, verse 6. Ten of the tribes were conquered by the Assyrians way back hundreds of years before Jesus was born. You read there. In the ninth year of King Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria, that's the capital of Israel, the northern kingdom, and carried Israel, those are the ten tribes, away to Assyria. Now later, the southern kingdom of Judah, they were carried to Babylon, but they came back. Those carried off to Assyria largely intermarried and disappeared as a distinct people. And so when Revelation says 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, can you please show me somebody from the tribe of Manasseh today? Or Issachar? Or Zebulun? When you talk about Jews, you're typically talking about people who are from Levi, Judah, and Benjamin. Now, my mother's maiden name was Tarsus. She was Jewish. And um, we understand maybe we were connected with Benjamin. My grandfather used to say we're related to Paul of Tarsus, but I'm not sure his theology was square. And then he would tell us we're related to Jonah who fled to Tarshish. And so my grandfather made up lots of stories. But anyway, technically, he said, oh, like Saul, we're from Benjamin. And so those three tribes came back from the Babylonian captivity. But the other nine tribes, you've heard of the ten lost tribes. And our Mormon friends say that those lost tribes sailed to the Americas and they became the American Indians. And I would respectfully disagree with that. I think the DNA studies 
say that the uh, American Indians and Native Americans are not the lost tribes of Israel. I worked for about a year and a half on the Navajo reservation. And one of my neighbors knocked on the door one day. He smiled. He said, Doug, I got good news. I said, what's up? He says, we're related. I said, what do you mean? He said, I found out I'm a Jew. <laughs> and he was smiling at me. I said, what's going on, Tim? He said, well, some Mormon missionaries just left my house. And they said, I'm actually a Jew. He said, no, I don't believe that. He says, I was in Vietnam. And he said, I know I look a lot more like those people than I do like you. Thank heavens. <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, but that was one theory that they said, oh, these are the lost tribes. But no, you read the Bible long before Jesus was born. It tells exactly what happened to the tribes. Some of them came back down and joined Judah. They intermarried with the tribe of Judah. You're not going to find people who are purebred people from Zebulun, Manasseh, Issachar, and so forth. So what does it mean when it says that? Galatians 3.29. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All the promises God made to the Jews in the Bible, New and Old Testament, you can claim through Christ. Amen? That's a wonderful promise. Paul said that. This is New Testament. Paul said in Romans 2, 28 and 29, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is it circumcision that is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart. This was the message of Jesus and John the Baptist. They said to their Jewish brethren, Do not think to say within yourself, God must save us, we are children of Abraham. God is able to raise up from the stones children unto Abraham. And Jesus said, Many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, meaning the Gentiles coming from the east and the west. And the natural children, some of them who don't believe, will be in outer darkness. And so the New Testament is really clear that now the gospel goes to everybody, whosoever will. God is no respecter of persons. So the idea that to be one of the 144,000, you must have a DNA test is not taught in the Bible. God does not discriminate that way. If you are Abraham's seed, you are heirs according to the promise, okay? So why does it give this list and why is the list unique in Revelation chapter 7? I'm going to read something to you. You know, in Hebrew, when they named someone, every name had a meaning. You read the story about when, you know, Jacob ended up with four wives. He only wanted Rachel. He ended up with Rachel and Leah and Bilhah and Zilpha, their handmaids. And, and every time, they all fighting over his attention. Every time they got pregnant and they had a child, the mothers would name the child and make a statement because the names all mean something in Hebrew. The name Judah means, I will praise the Lord. And we're putting this up for the, you on the screen. Reuben means he has looked on me. Gad, given good fortune. Asher means happy am I. Naphtali means my wrestling. Manasseh means making me to forget. It says Simeon means God hears me. Levi attached to me, unlike Levi's. Issachar purchased me. Dwelling is Zebulun. Joseph, God will add to me Benjamin, son of his right hand. Now what's fascinating is if you take these uh, 12 names, line their meanings up the way they're given there in Revelation. This is what it says. Look at this paragraph. I will praise the Lord for he has looked on me and granted good fortune. I am happy because my wrestling God is making me to forget. God hears me and is attached or joined to me. It's like a marriage. He has purchased me a dwelling. I've gone to prepare a place for you. And he will add to me the son of his right hand, meaning Christ. The whole story of salvation is told in the names, the way they're arranged there in Revelation. It's the story of redemption. Isn't that beautiful? So the Bible is such an incredible book. It tells us the 144,000 have special robes. The Bible tells us they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, symbolizing they are covered with the righteousness of Christ. It tells us they sing a unique song. That doesn't mean that you can't read off their music because it's their song. It means they've gone through an experience. It's like when the children of Israel went through Egypt. They sang this song of deliverance led by Miriam. And at the end of their 40 years, Moses wrote a song that talked about those who had survived their wanderings and how God would be first. Sometimes a song, you have to have the experience to know how to sing the song. It's like sometimes you'll hear a choir 
You might hear a choir in Ireland singing a Negro spiritual. And they may not know how to sing it the way it was written. Because they have not had the experience that gave birth to the song. Does that make sense? And so those who are the 144, they're singing a song nobody else can sing. Why? Because it says there in Revelation, these are those who, they've come out of a great tribulation. They follow the Lamb in a close way, unlike anyone else. All right. It says they sang, as it were, a new song. Something else it tells us, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. By the way, if you want to follow the Lamb there, then you must first follow the Lamb here now. And you can't say, well, I can't wait to get to heaven and start following the Lamb. You won't be in heaven unless you start following Him now. A Christian is a follower of Christ. And it says, they are virgins. And this has always thrown people. Does that mean all the 144,000 are women? Because the term there in Greek, it does seem to imply the feminine side. Keep in mind in Revelation, it talks about Babylon has daughters that are harlots, unfaithful. The 144,000 is saying they are virgins for they are not defiled. It's talking about they are part of the truth. They've not been defiled by the wine of Babylon. It's simply saying, not talking about sex at all. It's talking about they are a pure group because they believe the teachings of Jesus. They are undefiled by the false teachings. Now, everything that we've been telling you about the 144,000, you know what the key is to understanding it? They represent modern day apostles. See, in the Old Testament, I'm sorry, in the New Testament, rather, Jesus picked 12 apostles, and he said, I want you to be my advocates to take this message to the world. But they were not the only ones saved. They were a special group of leaders. Before the Holy Spirit is poured out in Acts chapter 2, Judas has killed himself. Peter said, there's only 11 of us now. We need to replace Judas and get back the number 12. When they replace Judas, the Holy Spirit falls out in the next verse. But there's not just 12 that received the Holy Spirit. There's 120 in the upper room. And then 3,000 are converted as a result of what they do. Which leads to the next question. Are the 144,000 the only ones saved when Jesus comes? Well, if you do the math, that would be pretty sad because there are about 7 billion people in the world today. There's more than 7 billion. And if only 144,000 are going to be saved, that means your chances about one out of 50,000. It's still better than the lottery in Florida. Did you know that? <clears throat> but it's not good. No, they're not the only ones saved. They are a special group of leaders. In the same way, let me make the 144,000 real easy for you. In the same way that Jesus had 12 apostles that followed him wherever he went, that had a special relationship with him, that sang, you know, the Bible says that Jesus, the only time he sang, he sang with the 12 he sang other times, but the only time recorded in the Bible when Jesus sang, he sang with the 12 apostles just before he went to the cross. They sang with the Lord, a special song. And so all the things about the 144,000, by the way, this is written by an apostle, isn't it? He's talking about their relationship with Jesus during the first coming. There's going to be an army of apostles getting the world ready for the second coming. Does that make sense? That's the 144,000. But now we've learned a little bit about them. What's the special name in their foreheads? It talks about a name, a seal. Keep in mind, it's not talking about a tattoo. You're going to find out all through the Bible in the Old Testament, it talks about in the hand and in the forehead. That means in your actions and in your thoughts. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 8, you'll bind them, speaking of the law, bind the laws. In Deuteronomy 5, Moses repeats the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 6, he says, You'll bind them as a sign on your hand. They'll be as frontlets between your eyes. What's that? Forehead. That the Lord's law might be in your heart. Another symbol. In the hand means in the actions. In the forehead means in the worship. In the thoughts. I'll make something really clear. In the last days, if you've got the law of the Lord in your heart and your actions and your mind, you will not have the mark of the beast. If you don't have the law of God in your heart, in your hand, in your head, you will have the mark of the beast. It's just one way or the other. 
Now you notice in Ezekiel 9, we always think the mark is the bad thing. If you read Ezekiel 9, there's another vision there. By the way, uh, Revelation is referring back to Ezekiel. That everybody in Jerusalem was to be destroyed except those that had this mark placed on them by the angel. Everybody in Ezekiel 9 who gets the mark is saved. Because they are sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in Israel. Because there was false worship that was happening among uh, the people of Israel. And you read that uh, chapter and you'll understand that. So what is the seal of God? All right, we talked about the 144,000. We're going to spend the rest of our time talking about this very important subject. And you pray for me as I proceed. Because I really want you to get this, friends. It is very important. All right, first of all, seal of God is the Holy Spirit. You already sort of knew that. Those that have the mark of the beast, whose spirit do they have? The devil. Those that have the seal of God, whose spirit do they have? It says there in Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, wherewith you are sealed for the day of redemption. There's a seal of the Holy Spirit that happens inside. But there's something that is more tangible than that, that can be seen in the life, and you'll find that in this verse. Isaiah 8.16, Bind up the testimony, seal the law, among my disciples. Can the law be sealed in the heart? So the law of God in a sense is the seal. What's the new covenant? I'll take my law and write it in their hearts. But we're going to go a step deeper. To find out what is that seal in the law. Now typically a seal. In Bible times you know when you would make a document official. They pour wax on the seal like you do with an envelope. They'd stamp it with the government seal and a seal always contained three characteristics. How many? It would have the name of the official, the title, and the territory. For example, I've got a copy here of Queen Elizabeth and in Canada it says Queen of Canada Elizabeth and that's the name. Queen, the office, Elizabeth, Canada. You know, she's also the queen of British Columbia. And so you would have three characteristics. When uh, Pontius Pilate put a seal on the tomb of Jesus, what did it say? Pontius Pilate, his name, governor, his office, Judea, his territory. When King Darius put a seal, the Bible says he put a seal on the stone placed on the lion's den, what did it say? Darius, king, Medo-Persia. You got those three things were always in a seal. You ever see the presidential seal? It's going to say the president's name, president, United States of America. And so you can have those three characteristics. Do you find the seal of God in the law of God? You do. It's in the middle of God's law, in the longest of the Ten Commandments. And here's what it reads. And you read in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you should labor and do your work, all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, nor your cattle or the stranger who is within your gates. Now here, watch carefully. For in six days the Lord, Jehovah, his name, created, made his office. He's a creator and sustainer, the heaven and the earth and the sea. There you have the name of God, the title of God, the territory of God. In the middle of the law of God is this seal. And what we're going to be talking about now is the Sabbath commandment and why it is an important issue in the last days because it talks about resting in the Lord. It talks about having a relationship. It talks about having the Father's name. Is the Father's name in that commandment? Jehovah. The Lord made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that is them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he howled at it. That means he made it holy. So here you've got those three characteristics. You've got his title, you've got his territory, you've got his name, all in the middle of the law. Now, I want, want you to just see from the perspective of, of the Bible and heaven why this would be so important. Is there a place in the world today, if I was going to say, I'm going to the Holy Land. I'm going on a Holy Land tour. Where am I going? Israel. Not too many people dispute that. And if I'm in Israel, I'm going to say, I'm going to the Holy City. Where am I going? Jerusalem. 
And then if I say I'm in Jerusalem, I'm going to go visit the Holy Mount. Mount Moriah, sometimes called Mount Zion, it's where the temple was. And in ancient times, if you went to the temple, you'd go to the Holy Temple. And in the Holy Temple, they had a place called the Holy Place. But the Holy Place had an inner sanctum called the Holy of Holies. And there was only one thing in the Holy of Holies. What was it? An ark. Golden box. We've all heard about this sacred golden box that's still missing today. What made the golden box such a national treasure? What did it have in there? Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, do you find the word holy? How many times? One time. Where is it? It's in the Sabbath commandment. Because God wants to make us holy. And life is composed of time. God is love. You with me? You cannot love without time. Wives usually get that better than husbands. They say, oh, you never do anything with me. I've been all home all day. But yeah, you've been on your computer. Now, this conversation never happened in our home. But... I said, I was here. That's not quality time. So we live all week long. But do we have quality time? Because love is nourished in quality time. God, when he created the world, he created and sanctified a quality time to nurture our relationship with him. And if you love God, if you know God, you'll love him. If you love him, you'll obey him. The devil is trying to destroy the quality time and the love relationship between people and God. And he is especially attacking the Sabbath. Of what two precious things does God say the Sabbath is a sign? Talking about a seal? It says it's a seal, it's a sign. Look in Exodus 31, 17. It says, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Someone's saying, oh, see, it's just between the children of Israel. Well, didn't we learn that if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed? It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea. That means it's a sign that he is a creator. Was he only a creator for Jews, or is he also a creator for everybody? Read in Exodus, or Ezekiel rather, Ezekiel 20 verse 12. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign. It's something unique about it. It's a symbol like a seal. That they might know that I am the Lord that does sanctify them. Does God only sanctify Jews or does everybody need to be sanctified by the Lord? Is he only the creator of the Jews or is he the creator of everyone? It's a sign of his creative ability, his ability to recreate us and make us holy or to sanctify. When did God's people stop needing that? Do we still need rest? Did God make the Sabbath only for Israelites? Well, let's think about it. How far back does the Sabbath go? Jesus said, Mark 2, 27, he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for Jews. And, well, you can spell Jews several different ways. One way is M-A-M. Does that what it says? Does it say Jews? That word there is talking about anthropos, everybody, humanity. The Sabbath was made for man, mankind. Quick test. How many here are related to Adam and Eve? Sabbath was made for man. When was it? Way back in the beginning. Jesus said that. It's not made for Jews. We all need that rest. He even said the animals rest, right? Not just Jewish animals. Do we need what God made for man? You know, the Bible also said, it's not good that man is alone. I will make a woman for him. Do we still need women? So before you get rid of what God made for man, be very careful. He made the Sabbath for man, and he says he made woman for man. We need it all. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Isaiah 56, 6. The Bible's really clear. It's for everybody. Also, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord, to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone, the stranger, the Gentile, that keeps the Sabbath day from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them I'll bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. What does he promise to everybody that remembers his commandment? Joy. It's to be a blessing. He didn't curse the day. He blessed the day, right? And some people worry about it. and Oh, pastor, I don't, I don't want to worry about this. Now, I've got to be gentle because... I get excited during this presentation, quite honestly. I remember when I first became a Christian, um, and even with my Jewish background, 
it never really clicked for me right away. And when I learned this, I was a little bit upset that nobody had told me this before because it was so clear. It was right there in the commandments, but finally it clicked. And I thought, how come people don't say more about this? It is one of the ten, they're not ten suggestions. They're not ten recommendations of God. They're not called the ten good ideas. These are ten commandments. And if there's a law to obey, if you're going to break the law of the highway patrol or the law of God, which is more important. Now, don't break either. But yeah, don't misunderstand. But, I mean, if there's a law that is really important, wouldn't it be the law of God? This is a commandment written by God in stone with his finger spoken with his voice. It should be something the church should say, maybe it's still a good idea. Now, some are saying, well, God just gave the Sabbath to the Jews there at Mount Sinai in the Ten Commandments. That's a mistake. If you look in your Bible, you'll see in Exodus 16... Ten Commandments come in Exodus 20, which is later. In Exodus 16, God tells them, I will give you bread from heaven six days a week, but you're not going to see any coming on the Sabbath. So gather twice as much on Friday. And when they went out looking for bread, they didn't trust the Lord. They still went out looking for it on Sabbath. God says, how long will you break my commandments? The Sabbath was a command that before they ever got to Mount Sinai, it goes all the way back to the beginning when God told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and do we need rest in this day of hyper stress? Boy, do we ever need the Sabbath? Someone uh, said that uh, stress, chronic stress, is linked to the six leading causes of death being heart disease, lung ailments, cancer, accidents, cirrhosis of the liver, suicide, and more than 75% of all physician office visits are stress for stress-related ailments and complaints. 75%, not just the office visits, I understand it's over 75% of the prescriptions can be related to stress. Maybe we still need the Sabbath. Maybe God knew what he was talking about. And that's why we're sharing these things, to be a blessing, friends, not a burden. Amen? So when did God establish the Sabbath truth, this seal that we're studying? Way back in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, after God made everything in six days. How, how many days in the week? Do you know there's seven days in the week when we went to China? And they're technically an atheistic country. Karen and I went to Russia. Right after the Iron Curtain fell, seven days of the week. In Korea, Japan, everywhere we've been, Australia, seven days a week. Why? It's really strange when you think about it. It's understandable why all the nations of the world, even before the spread of modern civilization, had 360 to 370 days in their calendar for a year. Because that's, they could see, they could observe, that's how long it took for the earth to go once around the sun. So it shouldn't surprise us that all the ancient civilizations had a year with about the same number of days. Shouldn't surprise us that they all had something like a month, because it's the lunar cycle. That's where you get the word month, moon. And we all know it takes 24 hours for the earth to revolve once on its axis. But where in the sun, moon, and stars do you get a seven-day week? Nowhere. The only place that the world can trace a seven-day week is to, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It all goes back to the Bible. Why do we have seven and not six? He finished everything in six days. Why do we have seven? He said, I'm not done yet. You're not going to enjoy anything I made in these six days unless you remember the seventh because you need to rest with me and to recharge your relationship to go forth and do what I've created to enjoy your paradise. It's part of God's perfect plan. He made a day to nurture our love relationships with him. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it, he had rested from all his work which he had created and made. Notice there's several things that he did there. What day of the week is the Sabbath? And this is where some people are surprised. Is it the first day, third day? The Bible says, and notice back in creation, I'm, I'm repeating that verse here in Genesis 2, and I want to accentuate something. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day, from all of his work which he had made. And it says that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. First time in the Bible God says something like this a number three times. What number is it? 
Seventh day, seventh day, seventh day. Now, you may think this is just caveman theology, but for me, I think it's very interesting that there in the beginning in Genesis, God says 777. You get to the last book in the Bible, it says you don't want the 666. It's like one is the number of God. Six in the Bible is the number of man. King Nebuchadnezzar makes a golden image. Sixty cubits by six cubits. It's probably six wide, six deep, sixty high, six, six, six. Tells everyone bow down. So when you get to Revelation, that number, you know, oh, I'm telling you, I got this in another study. I'll wait, keep coming. I'll cover something about that. Number nine. How has God demonstrated the importance of his holy Sabbath? It's not Pastor Doug's Sabbath. It's not the Jews' Sabbath. It's God's Sabbath. Notice he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he hallowed it. I was doing, doing a meeting like this one time and one of the individuals coming and a lot of people there and, and this pastor was there and he interrupted the meeting. He said, Brother Doug, he said, this is legalism. You're putting these people under bondage of works. I said, Brother, I'm telling them to keep the Sabbath commandment. I'm telling them to rest. You're telling them not to. You're telling them to work. So I'm saying rest. And he said, we're no longer under the law. And so he and I kind of got into an exchange right during the meeting. And, and I, you know, I had to deal with it. And I said, so do you think we should keep the Ten Commandments? He said, no. Some of his members were there. Kind of, they kind of gasped and looked at him because they'd never heard him say that. And he said, well, yes. But that, of course, would include the Fourth Commandment. And then he said, nine of them. <laughs> and so I said, so what you're telling me is the one commandment you think we're supposed to forget is the only commandment that begins with the word remember. That didn't make sense to me. He says, remember the Sabbath. Notice it says, he blessed the Sabbath day. There's some things he did to that day. In a special way, he rested, he blessed, and he sanctified. He made it holy. And he specified a certain day. He didn't say keep a Sabbath day. Did you notice that? It doesn't say God blessed the day and you just pick where you want to paste that blessing like a stamp. God says, I blessed the day. I'm going to meet with you. We don't pick our own day. It's a commandment. He doesn't say a seventh day, the seventh day. And it said, Jesus, the one reason I talk about this, notice the words of Christ in Matthew 5, 19. It said, whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach others so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What Christ is saying there is if you're breaking, you figure out what commandment you think is the least important. If you're breaking that and you're telling other people to break it, then those in heaven will speak of you as the lowest kind of individual. Because that's called sin, transgressing the law. But if you do and you teach, and so I'm just doing what Jesus said. He said, I want you to do it and I want you to teach it. He says, they will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say everybody would believe, did he? But I'm still going to continue to do and to teach. You know, friends, in the judgment day, I have to deal with God. You can't get me to heaven. He can. I need to make him happy. It's better to obey God than man. That's what Peter said, right? Amen. And so I just need to tell you that in the judgment day, if God says, Doug, why did you teach the Sabbath day? I'll say, Lord, you told me to. Jesus did. It's in the law. That's a pretty good reason to do something. Amen. Question 10. Which day did Jesus keep holy? A Christian is a follower of Christ, right? We still together? It says, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, went to his hometown and his custom is something you do once or twice or it's a way of life. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read the scriptures. Jesus regularly went to church, synagogue, church, same word, gathering it means, on the Sabbath day, read his Bible. It's probably still a good idea for us to do what Jesus did. Now, can you tell me where Jesus said not to do it anymore? No, there's nowhere in the Bible. He says, stop doing it. What about the apostles? Let's take Paul, for example. He wrote nearly half of the New Testament. What was Paul's custom regarding the Sabbath day? It says, Paul, as his custom was, he went into them and he reasoned with them uh, on three Sabbath. He went in and three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them out of the Scripture. Paul had a custom, he went in. Not just when he was talking to the Jews, 
He also did it with the Greeks. It says in Acts 18.4, He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks, meaning the Jews and the Gentiles. It was something that he did for everybody. So this, I believe, was a pattern you'll see all through the time of Christ with Jesus, with the apostles. Did the apostles also meet with the Gentiles on the Sabbath day? Was it just because they were trying to reach Jews? I want to stop a scripture popping into my mind. You know where Paul went when Paul went out to persecute Christians before he was converted? It says he entered into the synagogues looking for the Christians. Why? Because they were meeting on the same Sabbath day as the Jews. Because it was one of the Ten Commandments. You know what I think is odd? I, now I want to just make it really clear. There are going to be a lot of Christians in heaven that maybe didn't understand this. Are you with me? There are going to be people in heaven that maybe didn't know the truth about polygamy. Will there be people in heaven that had too many wives? Huh? Yes? David, Abraham. If I take an extra wife, will I make it to heaven? I won't make it through the day. If I, <laughs> even with the name Bachelor, I wouldn't make it through the day. But I could say, but, but dear, Jacob had four. Is she going to buy that? Because I know better. Right? So you want to know what the truth is, right? And you know, there's going to be good people that maybe didn't understand this. And I want to make it clear. Pastor Doug has preached in, not just attended. I preached in Methodist church. I used to teach in Methodist Sunday school. Preached in Baptist churches, many different Baptist Church of Christ, Assembly of God, Nazarene. I can't count all the different churches where by the grace of God they've invited me to teach. And I know there are good, loving Christian people that still don't know the Sabbath truth yet. So well clear on that? I'm not saying that there's people out there and if they don't know what I know, they're not going to make it. I believe there are loving Christian people out there, but the truth is still the truth and we need to teach it. And if I could talk to Jacob today, I'd say, don't marry any extra wives. That's not good. Right? And he'd say, I know. <laughs> All right. And so it says, I, I started with a question. Did the apostles also meet with the Gentiles? The answer, Acts 13, 42. By the way, this is written by a Gentile by the name of Luke. Luke is one of the New Testament writers that was probably not a Jew. It says, and when the Jews were gone out of the city, the Gentiles besought or asked that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. It says the next Sabbath, they almost the whole city came together. Did Jesus intend for his people to be keeping the Sabbath after he died for their sins? Down through history in the last days? You can look in that prophecy where Jesus is talking about the end of the world in Matthew 24. And he's talking about this time of trouble. And he said, pray that your flight be not in the winter. It's not talking about flying on United Airlines in the winter. I always try to avoid going through Denver in the winter or Chicago because you can get stuck. It's not talking about that kind of flight. It means fleeing for your life. Pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Why, if his people were not keeping the Sabbath anymore, then why would he say that? Except maybe he knew they would be keeping it. If you look in Revelation 14, Remember the 144,000 are in Revelation 14. If you look in verse 7, there the angel declares, Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of the fountains of water. Do you know that's an extract right from the fourth commandment about the Sabbath? For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea. And then he's the angel saying, worship him. What do we do in a special way on the Sabbath? It is a special time of collective worship. By the way, I meet people and they say, oh, Pastor Doug, I believe you're absolutely right. And I keep the Sabbath day. I don't, I don't do any work on the Sabbath day. You'd be surprised how many pastors have come up to me right here in Orlando. Next week, I'll be at what they call the NRB convention, National Religious Broadcasters Convention. A lot of dear friends from other churches, pastors. We know each other. We're friends. They know me. They see our TV programs. They know where I stand. And they'll come to me secretly. I'm not going to betray any of them. They'll say, Brother Doug, you know, you're right on that Sabbath business. And I want you to know I don't do any work on Saturday. I say, yeah, but do you gather for worship? Well, you know, my Sunday friends probably wouldn't understand if I did that. 
But you know, the Bible says in, in Leviticus 23, the Sabbath is a holy convocation. You know what a convention is? Convocation, assembly, a coming together. The people of God would come together to worship the Lord. It's a time to spend quality time with God. It says, worship him that made the heaven and the sea and the fountains of waters. Number 14, does the Bible teach that God's end time people would also be keeping the seventh day Sabbath holy? It says, the dragon was wroth with the woman. This is in Revelation chapter 12, 17. And he goes to make war with a rem. You wonder what the battle of Armageddon is. It's a war the devil makes against God's people. It's not China and Russia. And he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. And here are the two outstanding characteristics which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You can read also in Revelation 12, 14, similar verse. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So you can see that all through Revelation, now, everybody keeps some of the commandments some of the time. Most of you keep the commandments when you're sleeping. <laughs> you go to prison, you're going to meet people that keep a lot of the commandments. God is looking for people that believe all of them and are by the grace of God going to do their best to not just be hearers, but doers. You know, the Bible says, whosoever therefore shall break one commandment, he is guilty of all. So if you go to the judge and you say, I realize that I killed that person, but I keep all the other commandments. Is that defense going to work very well? Uh, you know, God says, look, you, you should do your best by the grace of God to keep all of them. Now, again, they're not the ten suggestions. And it says, blessed are those who keep his commandments, that they might enter through that they might eat from the tree of life and enter through the gates of the city. That again is Revelation 22, 14. Will all of the saved be keeping the Sabbath in heaven? Well, I think so. You can read here, it says in Isaiah 66, verse 22 and 23, For as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make will remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your name and your seed remain. And it will come to pass that from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come and worship before me. Is all flesh Jews? Or does all flesh mean everybody? He's talking about as the new heavens and the new earth. That's future, right? So if they kept it back in the Garden of Eden in the days of Adam, right? If we know Moses and the children of Israel kept it and the people of God in the Old Testament kept it, and Jesus kept it, and the apostles kept it, and we're going to keep it in heaven, why wouldn't we keep it now? Do we need rest now? Do we need quality time with God now? You know, friends, this is just such a, a, a very important subject. Some people would be saying, oh, Pastor Doug, you're making a big deal out of one commandment. It always strikes me as peculiar, and I didn't always believe these things. I I just said, Lord, I want to be in heaven. I want to follow your word. It's in the Bible. It may not be popular, but I want to be faithful. I know from worshiping with my brethren and sistren in all these different churches that I could go to almost any church in town and I could stand up if they invite me to preach and I could preach a sermon on honor your father and mother. You hear, amen, amen. They nod, fold arms, amen. They look at their teenagers, amen. I know because I've done it. I could go and I could preach a sermon on, thou shall not steal. And the folks might squirm a little bit, but they go, amen. I could talk about, thou shall not commit adultery. It gets quiet. <laughs> but you'll hear some amens. I could talk about, do not have other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God. I could preach on almost any of the other nine commandments. And everybody say, Amen. But if you have the audacity to say, remember the Sabbath day, the seventh day is the Sabbath, people say, oh, no, no, we're not under the law, we're under grace. <laughs> people have no problem with the Ten Commandments until you present the one that they're all forgetting. Why did God say remember? Because he knew we'd forget. There's something inconceivable. If you're going to be a biblically honest Christian, then at least say, say, Pastor Doug, you know, keeping the Sabbath is going to be a real problem for me. All right, well, let's just be honest. Give it to God. But don't say it doesn't matter. Now this is a revelation program. Prophecy program. Why are you talking about this, Pastor Doug? Follow my logic. See if it doesn't make sense. Daniel chapter 3. The king makes a law. 
Everybody's got to worship the image or they die. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will not worship the image because one of the commandments is don't do it. Do not make images and bow down. Daniel chapter 6, King Darius makes a law. I am to be your God for 30 days. Just 30 days. Daniel says, I am not going to close my windows and stop praying to Jehovah. Because one of the commandments is thou shalt not have other gods. So he goes to the lion's den. But God saves him. God saves Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego from the fiery furnace. Revelation 13. Whoever doesn't worship the beast in his image cannot buy or sell and will ultimately be killed. If we don't understand how important the law is, then how are we going to have the faith of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the last days? We're going to be like all the other compromising, wishy-washy people who say, Lord, Lord, but they're not really doing what God says. So yes, it does matter, friends. And the devil's very clever. Back in the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he said, I'm going to see if I can make a law, get them to break the second commandment. And then in the days of Daniel with Darius, he said, I'm going to try and get them to break the first commandment. And here we are at the end of time, he's going to say, I'm going to get them to break the fourth commandment. But I'll be very clever. I'll say, yeah, go to church, just don't go the seventh day. See, God, he keeps trying to, it's like with Daniel. He's, he tries to say, um, yeah, you don't have to worship other gods forever, just for 30 days. Just shut your windows and don't let your light shine for 30 days. See, the devil, he's very clever. But a commandment's a commandment. It's like, you know, what wife would accept the argument, dear, I promise I am not going to commit adultery very often. <laughs> would you ever accept that? Are you jealous for love? So what do you want God to say? Do you think he loves you less? Say, so I don't care if you worship the devil, you know, just a little bit. I don't care if you keep 90% of the Ten Commandments. I'm going to give you a discount, 10% discount. That's not what God says. And when we go to church in heaven, who's going to be the preacher? All flesh will come to worship before me. Will anybody be sleeping during the sermon then? When Jesus preaches in heaven, will it be a joyful time? That's what the Bible says. Can we be certain that modern day, what we call Saturday, is the same Sabbath day that Jesus kept? People say, well, Pastor, the calendar's changing. How do we know which day it was? Read in your Bible. It's pretty clear. Look in Luke, for instance, chapter 23. Go to verse 54. It's near the end of Luke. It says, the day when Christ was crucified was the preparation, what we commonly call Friday. They call it Good Friday. And the Sabbath drew on. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments, and they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now, Luke is a Gentile. Why would he say they rested the Sabbath according to the commandment if Jesus taught the disciples the Sabbath doesn't matter? How can anyone think that the disciples didn't think the Sabbath was important because it was so important to them that even after Jesus was dead and no longer speaking, they look at each other and they say, look, the sun is going down. We're not going to be able to finish embalming his body before the Sabbath. So let's just do our best, kind of wrap him up. We'll put him in the tomb. We will come back Sunday morning and finish. We're going to go home and keep the commandment. So where did the disciples ever get the notion that it didn't matter to Jesus? It was so important to them and so important to Jesus, they would not even finish their labor of love because the Sabbath was approaching. And then on the first day of the week, they came back to finish. Praise God. The angels had rolled away the stone. Christ rose. And that was the first day, which is what? Easter Sunday. So there you've got it, friends. You've got Friday, the preparation day, Sabbath. Is the day you realize Jesus died just before the Sabbath and he rested from his work of saving man. He rose Sunday morning to continue his work as our high priest. Jesus even kept the Sabbath in death. Yep. Yep. It's interesting that uh, Adam went to sleep on the sixth day of the week and his wife was born. Jesus went to sleep on the sixth day of the week and the bride came out of his side that was opened up. The side of Adam was open too, right? Interesting. Look in any encyclopedia, a normal calendar. Look in the dictionary. It will say, seventh day, Saturday. First day, Sunday. Some countries change it to a work week, but that doesn't change the day. It's pretty clear. If you speak other languages, you know in of the languages of the world, 
Let me see here. Out of 105 languages in the world, uh, the word for the seventh day is sabado, Saturday, Sabbath day. If you're Russian, subota. Hebrew, Shabbat. Even in these ancient languages, it's still called the Sabbath is the word they use for the seventh day, even though they don't keep it. It's amazing. You can go to a lot of South American countries and they all call the seventh day Portuguese, Spanish, Sabado. The Sabbath day. Because it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Oh, pastor, we're not sure, you know. You might convince me that a Jewish family got lost on a deserted island and they lost track of the days of the week. Or they were caught in a bad storm and they couldn't tell day from night and they forgot what day was the seventh day. But to say that 16 million Jews around the world all forgot their Sabbath day, so we don't know anymore, I don't think you're going to convince me of that. And then there are people who will say, well, there's been changes in the calendar. We really don't know. That's, that's a myth if you think about it. No change to the calendar ever affects the weekly cycle. It fools people because the week is printed on the calendar. Whatever you do with the calendar doesn't change the week. There have been changes to the calendar. The, we're now under the Gregorian calendar, changed from the Julian calendar. Let me tell you what happened. Back in 1582, Thursday, the 5th of October, was followed by Friday, the 15th. They added 10 days. The 4th was followed by the 15th. But Thursday was followed by Friday. The weeks were not affected. That's why your birthday lands on a different day of the month, or no, a <laughs> different day of the week every year. Oh, and someone wrote a letter to the U.S. Naval Observatory that uh, they said, have there been any changes in the calendar that it affect the weekly cycle? And they wrote back and said, in our knowledge, there has been no change in the calendar that ever affected the continuity of the weekly cycle. So when people use that argument, you know what I also think is very interesting? I talk to my friends that, uh, you know, they may go to church on another day and they say, oh, we don't know what the days of the week are. I say, well, if you don't know what day is Saturday, you don't know what day Sunday is either, do you? They have no problem knowing what days are what until they learn the Sabbath truth. Then they get real confused about the days. It even says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9, There remains therefore the keeping of a Sabbath for the people of God. Some people say, well, we don't keep the Sabbath because it's the one commandment that's not repeated in the New Testament. Another myth I often hear. There is a commandment that is not repeated verbatim in the New Testament. You know which one it is? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Where is that in the New Testament? Who here believes it's okay to take the name of the Lord in vain? And the Sabbath, by the way, it is sort of in the New Testament. Hallowed be thy name, right? The name of God should not be blasphemed. So the principles in the New Testament. But the idea that it's not repeated in the New Testament, that's not accurate. So when do we celebrate the Sabbath? When does it start? When does the Sabbath end? It's not two in the morning like daylight savings time. In the Bible, the days began and ended at sundown. You can read that in Leviticus. It tells us there that from even unto even, you will celebrate your Sabbath. Isn't that a pretty picture? And then again, you read in the New Testament. I'll give you one from each. They came to Jesus after sundown to be healed. He never told them, I want to heal you on the Sabbath. But they waited until it says, at even when the sun did set. So it's at sundown when the Sabbath begins and the Sabbath ends. So what day is the Lord's Day that's mentioned in Revelation 1.10? It's a Revelation study we're doing. The vision that God gave John, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. How many of you have heard somebody refer to Sunday as the Lord's Day? I hear it all the time on the radio. I always want to ask a pastor, where is the verse on that? It just sounds good. It's been repeated, repeated a million times. People probably sung songs about it, but it doesn't say that in the Bible. It does tell us what day is the Lord's Day in the Bible. You can read, for instance, in, uh, and by the way, that's Revelation 1 verse 10. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and I heard a voice behind me. John was a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos. They may have been making him work in some of the mines but he refused to work on the Sabbath. And the whole vision of Revelation may have come to him on the Sabbath day. Because the Bible says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. What is the Lord's day? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jews? Or does the Bible command and say of the Lord? And you can read in Isaiah 58. 
There he tells us, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day. Which day is it? He calls this the Sabbath, my holy day. And again, Mark chapter 2, verse 28. Jesus said, therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. All through the Bible, God identifies his day. If there's a day of the week that's his day, it's the one he set aside, he sanctified it, he blessed it, and he kept it. And he wants us to do that. What blessing is promised by the Sabbath commandment? Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So every commandment of God, you've got the letter of the law, then you've got the spirit of the law. We talked about this before, right? Letter of the law says don't commit adultery. The spirit of the law says do not be thinking it in your heart. Letter of the law, do not kill. Do not murder, it actually says. Spirit of the law, do not be angry with your brother or sister without a cause. Letter of the law, do not bear false witness. Spirit of the law, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be honest in your heart, in your communication. Some people lie with their body language. She said, be honest. Letter of the law, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Spirit of the law, come unto me and I will give you rest. And as people gather together to worship God every Sabbath day, there is a rest that comes. It reminds us that he's the God who created us. And you know what the salvation is all about? I will create a new heart within you. The Bible says we will be, old things are passed away, all things are made new. We are a new creation in Christ. He made a day holy. If he can make a day holy, can he make us holy? And so every Sabbath, remembering he is God. He is my creator. We are resting in Jesus. We're resting in the promises of his salvation. It is a beautiful thing. It's like that song where it says he walks with me and he talks with me in the Garden of Eden. He probably met in a special way with Adam and Eve there in the garden and communed with them and they worshipped him. And then the rest of the week, by the way, uh, the commandment not only says rest the seventh day, it says six days thou shalt labor. And I had one pastor say, Brother Doug, says, you worship God on Saturday, says I worship God seven days a week. Some of his friends were laughing. I said, well, brother, uh, I worship God seven days a week too, but I don't keep the Sabbath seven days a week because that doesn't mean you're holy. That means you're lazy. <laughs> so six days you shall labor and do all of your work. You can worship God all week long. We should worship God, right? We live in an attitude of prayer and worshiping God. But you're to lay aside your labor in a special way. So you're going to hear all kinds of uh, clever arguments and things, but hey, friends, you can't get away from the commandments of God. If God thought it was so important, that he spoke it from a mountain. He gives it to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Do we still need a day of rest today? Do we still need a day of worship? Then did God tell us, I have set aside and blessed a particular day? Should we say, God, it's not convenient to do it the day you pick. I'm going to pick my own day. Well, it depends who's your God, you or him. Do we do what God says? He says, I have made an appointment with you on the seventh day. If you love me, prove it. Keep my commandments. Now, before I go any farther, I know some people are hearing this and your minds are spinning. You know, there's a lot of things you could teach in a Revelation seminar. It's interesting trivia. People want to know, well, you know, Pastor Doug, so when does this age begin? And, and what does this symbol in Revelation mean? And what does that symbol mean? Oh, that's very interesting. Very interesting. But you know what's different about this presentation? When people learn the Sabbath truth, they go, whoa, that would actually affect my time. That would affect my life. That would affect my schedule. You know, my father, when I was growing up, he was a multimillionaire. Had a lot of money. He was always busy. I wanted time with my father. And he'd say, oh, Doug, look, you know, I'm busy. I got a lot I got to do. Here's five dollars. Go to the movie. It was easier for him to give me a tip than to give me his time. And you know, sometimes you go, oh Lord, yep, yeah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But to, when you start giving God your time, that means he's really your God. And that's why this subject is such a serious subject. Because it really has to do with, is he our God? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he wants to bless you, friends. Amen? Amen. Now, this is a commandment of God. He says, remember 
the seventh day, not remember a seventh day. This is the seal of God because there in the middle of God's law, you've got the name of God. You've got the word holy. You've got the context of worship. You've got time. The Ten Commandments are divided in two parts. First commandments deal with our love relationship with God. Second group commandment chapter uh, number five on through ten deal with our love for our fellow man. In the middle of God's law, the longest commandment, in the center of his law, the only commandment that begins with the word remember is very unique because it tells us that he not only has our minds, he's got our time. And this is what it means. He, he's our God. We worship him and he is going to be first in our lives. Now, I know you've heard some new things. I hope that you'll study this out honestly. If you have questions on this subject, we would encourage you to write them in, friends. Just go to the Prophecy Encounter website and just send us questions on this. I will do, I'm not afraid of any questions because the truth should stand up to investigation. Amen? I will be happy to, I've done it many times. I'll stand to, uh, next to another minister who disagrees in using the Bible. Let's see who's got the commandment. Amen. Matter of fact, before I close, I'll just ask you, show me one commandment in the Bible where we're told to keep the first day as the Sabbath. That's a live program. It's just not there. Is there a commandment to keep the seventh day? It's repeated many times in the Bible. By the way, you want more information on this? Great website called SabbathTruth.com. You can look that up. But in the meantime, before we close, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you who are watching? Let's bow our heads. Loving Lord, we've covered a lot of material tonight about the 144,000 and the seal of God. Lord, bring it all alive with your Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts. Help us know how to apply these things and settle into the truth. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Tomorrow night we'll be here. The Woman of Light, a very important study.